Yo, it's your boy Zach back at it again with some more Dino Talk. Did you know that there is a fossil so well preserved that scientists have actually been able to see what color this animal was? Welcome to Zachosaurus, folks. My name is Zach and I'm a science educator. And what we will learn today is about Borealopelta Mark Micheli, one of the best preserved dinosaurs ever found. Wait, 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 hold on. Boreal, bo boreal, Borealopelta? What kind of dinosaur name is that anyway? Well, actually, this dinosaur was a armored dinosaur, part of the family that you know very well, Ankylosauria. Famous for, of course, the Ankylosaur, which is known for having a pretty big tail club that could punch into other dinosaurs' legs. Now, it is not part of the Ankylosaurid family, which is a subdivision of the group in which, you know, Ankylosaur belongs, but it's very closely related. It's the sister group called the Nodosauridae, which are other armored dinosaur with, you know, the only difference is that they don't have a tail club, they have really big uh, shoulder spines, and a smaller snout. So, you know, same, same, but different. Now, this dinosaur lived about 110 million years ago in the early Cretaceous of northern Alberta. And this location actually is the reason why it's called the Northern Shield Borealo Pelta. Now, northern Alberta, more precisely in the area of Fort McMurray, is where they do mine for oil sands. And that's how they actually found the fossil. You know, while they were mining, uh, they stumbled upon a magnificent fossil. And because it was found using these, you know, very controversial and environmentally impactful techniques, uh, the debate whether or not these fossils should still be studied for the sake of, you know, dirty, uh, dirty fossils, is a subject for perhaps another video. So now let's just focus on what then the paleontologists did analyze uh, about this super fossil that was discovered there. So first off, well, being a terrestrial animal, it is very odd because in this area, they usually find ammonites and mosasaurs and plesiosaurs. And for those who don't know what these are, they're marine animals. So what was it doing there in the first place? Well, what they believe is that a flood basically washed out this animal in a river. Then, you know, it just floated down the river, sunk at the bottom of this spot in the ocean, uh, back first. And then some bacteria starting, you know, working their way all around the armor. And by doing so, they created a very thick bacterial film all around it. And therefore, encasing the armor in a cocoon that would preserve it so exquisitely well. That we know what it looked like to honestly a degree that will really shock you, even after 110 million years. Right off the bat, this animal was covered in a very thick kind of scale called a scute. Now, scutes are present on crocodiles, and that's what makes their armor so strong. And it's also present on, on birds' foot. So a scute is basically a scale that is thickened by keratin. This is the material keratin, basically, that makes my nails so strong and my hair so goddamn fabulous. So, um, speaking of armor, this animal also had other components of armor called osteoderms. So especially in the head and shoulder region, these osteoderms, which are basically bony growths that grow from the skin of the animal, were very well preserved. And I mean, honestly, it's not much of a surprise. I mean, osteoderms are quite common in fossils. What is unique is that it is still covered in its keratinous sheath. So just like the horns of, for example, a cow or a bison, these osteoderms would be covered in a keratinous sheath. And it's really interesting because it is it has never really been found in dinosaurs before. And what that allows us to know is first off, how did they grow? And second, what was the exact shape of the horn over this bony growth, which as we know in the animal kingdom, especially in mammals, can vary quite a lot. So that is an absolutely impressive find, I'll be honest with you. Speaking of horns, this animal being a notosaur has very prominent shoulder spikes. And we know that these shoulder spikes, well, first, they're very, very well preserved. Therefore, we know that they were colored a little li more lightly than the rest of the body. Therefore, you know, perhaps serving a sort of display. But wait, I did say less colored than the body. Because guess what, folks? This animal, we know the color of this 100 million year old rock dinosaur. Like, I mean, how cool is that? I cannot express how ecstatic I am right now explaining you this. I mean, I remember very well in kindergarten when I was a young kid, not giving a crap about life, you know, eating my pudding and all that kind of stuff. We were debating about what colors dinosaurs were because our teacher told us, hey, boys and girls, you will never know what colors dinosaurs will be. They could have been pink, they could have been yellow, they could have been orange. But now you know what? We know at least for one dinosaur what color it was. And I'll explain you how we know that. So you see pigments, uh, they make animals colored, right? And 
in the animal kingdom, one of the most widespread and quite tough pigments is melanin. Now, melanin is produced, you know, by melanosomes in your cells and everything, but that's not really important. What's really important is that they are distributed in two different families. You got the eumelanins, which give the black and white hues on an animal's body, and the pheomelanins, which give a more reddish hue. And in the case of Borealopelta, we know its back region and the animal was has much, much, much byproducts of theomelon, and therefore, this dinosaur was a ginger. Now, if it had a soul or not, I'm not, I don't really know, but this red-headed dinosaur might look a lot something like this. My dudes, my gals, feast your eyes upon its magnificence, Borealopelta Mark Mitchell, I here rendered by paleo artist Julius Sotoni, which honestly, I think, did a quite fantastic job at rendering the animal in its life form. Now, notice one thing, Julius not only did a really good job, to be very honest, but he also made the belly of the animal a lot lighter than the top of it. And do you know why? Now, this is not a creative liberty Julius took. It's actually, from fossil evidence, it does appear that the belly of the animal is lighter because it probably was doing counter shading. Now, counter shading is a form of camouflage that is seen in many animals that have a predatory pressure their entire lives, which means they always have, whatever the stage of their lives, always have a chance, a high chance of getting hunted by other animals. Therefore, they try to conceal themselves. So therefore, this is very common in African gazelles, it's very common in deers, in rodents, and not so common in animals who don't have this pressure of, you know, trying to hide from predators like the elephant, the cape buffalo, and the rhinoceros. And what I'm trying to say here is that this dinosaur, which was armored to the teeth and, you know, was 1300 kilograms, so the size of a car, still had some counter shading, some pretty good counter shading going on. So therefore, it was maybe trying to hide from predators. I mean, honestly, that hints at a predator prey dynamic that is unlike anything we see today on land on Earth. Because you see, <clears throat> an animal this size today wouldn't even have to bother with any predators today. But we're talking about the dinosaur world, the Cretaceous, where some animals, some flesh-eating animals, were about five tons in weight. And also, they were sight predators. Therefore, animals had to hide for their lives, no matter how big or mighty they might have been. Now, to be completely honest with you folks, this, uh, this whole discovery has been met with a bit of criticism from other paleontologists. For example, how do they know their color in the first place? And how do we can we infer a different predator-prey relationship based on the counter shading? And if you do want to learn more about that, you know, I, I can link an article below in the description. You can just go check it out and you'll learn about a lot more about all that. But please stay very critical while doing so uh, because there are a bit of discrepancies all around. But folks, otherwise, it's been an absolute pleasure doing this video. Thank you very much for joining me once again. And if you want more of that kind of stuff, uh, you know, just hit the like button and subscribe because I will be back in two weeks with some further crunchy stuff. So folks, stay curious and uh, goodbye.